Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this 2014 15 um, public lecture series. So, my name's Karen Chapman, and I work in this building, the Queen's Medical Research Institute, which is one of three university research buildings on this campus. The other ones being the Chancellor's Building, and then across the other side of the hospital, the Centre for Regenerative Medicine. So, we have three research centres in this building. We have Centre for Cardiovascular Science, which is my own research centre. Then we have the Centre for Inflammation Research on the second floor. And on this ground floor, we have the Centre for Reproductive Health. So as usual, we have um, two speakers for you. This time, they, both of these speakers were trained as scientists. Um, Professor Heather Kuby has been working within the National Health Service, though, for a large part of her career running um, path pathology services um, and also running research labs. Professor Sarah Howie works in this building in uh, the Centre for Inflammation Research. So I'd just also like to say that this um, series of talks is sponsored by the Medical Research Council as well. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's very good of you to come out on this absolutely ghastly day and we hope that you will be as enthused by the sort of things that Sarah and I are going to talk about as we ourselves are. Um, let me make sure that I can get this right. Okay, so, yes, I have. Cervical cancer is what we're, the main topic of, what, of our um, talk this evening, but how we can do something about cervical cancer is really underlying that. Cervical cancer is the most common cancer in women in many countries of the world, and even in more developed countries, it's the second or occasionally the third most common. So very, very prevalent. And if you look at the colouring on this map, you can see there are some areas which are dark blue. This is where the prevalence is highest and the deaths from cervical cancer are highest. Our comparison tonight is going to be between Scotland and the UK, and Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly Malawi, which is just set in here. We've been very, very lucky that the Scottish Government and Scotland, the Scottish NHS has invested heavily in helping to reduce the burden of cervical cancer and cervical disease over decades. We've garnered lots of information, evidence and expertise and it is right that we should try and apply that expertise amongst those who are less fortunate than ourselves. I'd like you to consider a tornado. Up at the top of the tornado there, you've got East Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa particularly, where both the incidence and the deaths from cervical cancer are maximum. Whereas at the bottom here, you've got uh, the States, Europe, Aust Australia and New Zealand. Um, and this is, reminds me, this shape reminds me very much of a tornado. Interesting. But those of you who are good at your weather patterns know that actually the power in a tornado, tornado is at the bottom, not the top. So I reckon that this is because of the power of effective interventions to prevent uh, cervical disease be turning into cancer. The reason we can do something about it is because cervical cancer is actually caused by a virus, the human papillomavirus, or HPV, which is very, very common. About 70% of all people will be infected with at least one HPV type during their lifetime. And indeed, it's reckoned that everyone who is ever sexually active will have had a genital HPV infection at some point in their life. Let's think a little bit about the virus. This is an early electron micrograph uh, taken by me of the virus from a Veruca many, many years ago. And all the particles that are white, like this, are infectious virus. Whereas those that look black in the middle have lost their nucleic acid and they are non-infectious. Just remember that for what comes later. There are, however, about 180 different types of HPV, 
They don't all cause cancer, so don't get too worried about that. About 30 of those types can be sexually transmitted. The others are related to hands, face, and other parts of the skin. And within that 30, 12 are particularly high risk. That means they are associated with the development of cancer. If you're good at remembering numbers, there are a few that are worth remembering. So the Verrucas and this image relates to HPV1. If you've ever had warts on your hands, which many small children do, it's usually HPV2. Genital warts are HPV6 and 11, nearly all of them. And interestingly, the majority of cervical cancers are associated with HPV16. It is one of the high risk HPV types and the one that is most common. So that when you look at this map of infection instead of disease, what do you find? That the deep red marks here represent where infection is most prevalent, less so in Asia. And that of course matches largely with the dark blue areas on that first map of cervical cancer mortality. But if you look at these black circles, which give the types, the top biggest black circle in each place is 16. So all around the world, HPV 16 is the most prevalent. Overall, we expect that about 10% of healthy women at any time would be carrying a genital HPV. That's a figure that's also worth remembering. Here in Scotland, as I mentioned, we've been fairly fortunate in the funding, both from the Scottish Government and from the NHS in Scotland, um, in setting up all the systems that are required to have good research um, to inform what will happen in, in relation to service delivery. We set up a Scottish Cervical Cancer Prevention Programme, in fact two programmes, and as an aspiration of the network of people who are working together around Scotland, we are trying to understand HPV biology better from basic research through trans to translational research in the clinic through to changes in services that are influenced by the research data we collect. Now it's really interesting because Scotland has had um, um, played a major part in understanding of HPV as a virus right from the 1960s. So the fact that we're continuing to do so uh, here, not just in Edinburgh but throughout Scotland, is really important too. What about a bit of science? Let's learn a little bit about the virus itself. First of all, it's what we call an icosahedral virus. This is the shape here. This is a computer diagram of it. The outside is a protein coat, and these proteins are arranged in a very strong icosahedral shape. That's an icosahedron. That's my new greenhouse, actually. A geodesic dome has the same shape as many viruses, including papilloma viruses. And I have to tell you, the viruses discovered the strength of this shape long before the uh, engineers who created greenhouses. If we then look at the genomic map of the, the virus here, it's really a very simple small virus with only eight genes carried in DNA. And of those eight genes, two of them, two early genes called E6 and D7, are the ones that are different in the viruses, the virus types that are associated with cancer. We call those oncogenes because they interact with cellular genes to help the progression towards cancer. Some of the basics about genital HPV I translate into a traffic light system. I've already said that it's a very, very common infection, which largely clears without anyone knowing anything about it. No symptoms, no treatment, just as many colds and hopefully this cough of mine will actually disappear without having to do very much about it. However, in the genital area, most of those infections do occur uh, shortly after sexual debut. And that's because you need close skin contact to transmit the virus from one person to another. And obviously, in sexual, close sexual contact, you're increasing the chances of transmission. So much so that if you look 
at HPV infection in young women, it's about 50% here in Scotland. Compare that with the 10% worldwide across the whole age distribution that I mentioned earlier. Nevertheless, most low-grade disease will disappear without treatment, even though we can see the beginnings of abnormalities. And high-grade disease, the pre-cancers, can still be cured with treatment. So that's the amber part of the traffic light. We need to be wary, but we can do something about it. Within cervical cancers, 99% are caused by this group of high-risk HPV types. And of those, at least 70%, in this country probably nearer 80%, of the cancers are associated with two types, HPV-16 and to a lesser extent HPV-18. Why is cervical cancer a problem when I said that it's very common in everyone, males and females, who are sexually active? Well, that's because of our anatomy in the reproductive tract. This lovely diagram is a drawing of Leonardo da Vinci's. So for many hundreds of years, we have known what's the female reproductive tract and the entrance uh, into the uterus through the cervix is really like. This is a diagrammatic, um, uh, a diagram of the same thing. And just here is an area of skin cells, skin's a barrier, and these skin cells or epithelial cells um, change on the outside there and the inside here of the cervical canal. This is called the transformation zone. And the complex processes that happen within the cells mean that this change in cellular structure makes the area much more susceptible to cancer development. So although we have infection in men, penile cancer is associated with HPV, but it's very rare. And in fact, there is no equivalent of a transformation zone, and so we don't get high incidences as we do with women. So how does it actually happen? What's the process? First of all, the virus gets in through, sorry, through what we call a micro abrasion, tiny little scratches which disturb the barrier of the skin right down to the bottom layer, the basement layer here. Down here are dividing cells, the so-called stem cells of the skin. As you rise through the skin, these cells change so that they contain more keratin and form a more effective barrier. We call that differentiation of the cells. And HPV is very clever. It requires differentiating cells to go through its virus replication cycle and produce infectious virus. So in this stage here and here, we might have a virus infection which begins, but the virus is able to go through the whole cycle and eventually be sloughed off the surface in the keratinocytes, the cells, the dead cells that are full of keratin, together with infectious virus. However, if the virus hangs around down here, where the cells are not differentiating, then it can actually stay there and not go through its, in, its whole replication cycle and start producing more of proteins like the E6 and E7 uh, oncogenes. And as you get more and more of these, the green, darker green ones, you go from mild disease to moderate to severe disease to frank cancers, which then break through the basement layer and invade the rest of the body. You can see here just how long that process can take, up to 10 years. That's why interventions are possible. We've got 10 years, roughly, to be able to get rid of the infectious and disease-producing cells. Let's think about cervical cancer, not just in the world as a whole, but in number numerical terms in Europe. 31,000 new cases every year, of whom at least 13,000 women die. 
and another 175,000 are living with cervical cancer, perhaps because it has been treated, perhaps because it has not yet been diagnosed and dealt with. But cervical screening can prevent most of those cancers. So the first powerful part of the tornado, the first intervention I want us to think about, is cervical screening. And for years, people have obtained some cells, scraped them off the cervix, put them onto a glass slide, sent them to the laboratory, which has looked at them under a microscope and looking for abnormalities. So if we look up here, this is a normal cervical smear. These are the kind of sloughed off surface cells. These are a little deeper, but you can see they've all got quite small nuclei. This picture, the nuclei are bigger and surrounded by a halo. These are in abnormal cells, but they're just at an early stage of abnormality. What can you see down here? Much bigger nuclei clumping together, and here, giant nuclei. The, nucle the regulation of the cell is completely out of step, and that's very obvious in um, the cells from a cervical smear. In much of the world, they call it pap smears. So if you ever hear of someone talking about a pap smear, that's the same as a cervical smear. And these days, we talk about cervical screening rather than smears. And I'll explain why in just a minute. So I said 31,000 cases, new cases a year in Europe. How many do you think are diagnosed each year in the UK? Hands up for 30. 300. 3,000. Yes, you're right. 3,000 new cases each year in the UK. That number would be several times greater if we didn't have the excellent cervical screening program that we have. It's population based. It means that every woman aged somewhere between 20 and 65, depending on which part of the UK you're in, will have an invitation sent for them to come for screening every three to five years. Smears will be taken, or cells will be taken, uh, not in the way they used to be, um, but in a new way. But the point is that as soon as population-based screening was introduced, you can see what happened. A dramatic drop in the incidence of uh, cervical cancer in the UK. These days, we don't make a smear on a glass slide in the GP uh, surgery. Instead, it's with a brush and it goes into liquid and the liquid sample is sent to the laboratory. Which, and it's spun through uh, this filter system so that you get nice clean slides that are much easier to read and fewer inadequates. It also leaves part of the sample for us to be able to do other tests such as looking for HPV itself. And yet, in the UK, despite the intervention, cervical cancer remains the most common cancer in women under 35. 300,000 women each year will be told they've got a cervical abnormality. And most of those we can deal with, provided they come for screening. You were right in saying 3,000 diagnosed each year. One every three hours, and three women dying every day in this country, despite good cervical screening. So we could do even better, and that's part of the research work that we're doing here, um, and indeed the service changes that have happened in the last few years, again with investment in Scotland. We can screen the cervical samples to detect the high-risk HPV types. Now, unlike most of laboratory medicine, this is a, an area where we're looking for negative results. We don't want positive results because the negative result, an HPV negative, means that that woman is not at risk of cervical cancer. There is no disease there. A positive HPV result will pick up all women who are infected. And yet we know from what we've said that the vast majority of those infections 
will clear without a problem. So we have to find a way of identifying those who are at highest risk, not those who've just got infection, but those that are progressing to disease. And I'm now going to hand over to Sarah to tell you a little bit about what we do um, and how we need to look further at these areas. Um, and no doubt embarrass my daughter and my husband sufficiently already. Okay, so I'm just going to talk to you a bit about immunity and vaccination. And first of all, we need to think about how do viruses actually persist because it's the persistent infection with HPV that increases the risk of cancer. So here's a, s a few tips if you're a smart virus on how to persist inside the body. So the first tip is not to actually kill your host. Ebola is unlikely to be a persistent virus. The second tip that's related to not killing your host is to pick a niche environment like the cervix where there's not actually much of an immune system around. And finally, what you want to do is you actually want to hide from the immune system so that it can't recognize you. Whatever the bits about you that still stick out in the immune system can see, you actually want to use to fool the immune system so that it doesn't actually generate a response that will get rid of you. In other words, you don't want to self-vaccinate. In order to do that, you want to generate an inefficient or a misdirected immune response so that you make the response to your dirty old trainers while you're running away in bare feet. And this ability allows not only the virus that's there to persist, but other viruses that are related to come in as well. And in fact, most of the women that we examine have probably got more than one type of HPV in their cervix. So HPV actually does a really good job of camouflaging itself by hiding inside our own cells to avoid the immune system. And that means that infection with HPV does not always going to induce protective immunity. So the second really powerful intervention that we've had in recent years is vaccination for HPV. And the reason we need vaccination is that the infection, yes, it can induce immunity, but it's not good at getting rid of the infection. And it also does not protect against disease development. So we really need to vaccinate before anybody gets infected in the first place in order to induce protective immunity. There's two different types of vaccines that have been used by the NHS in the UK. The first one that was introduced was Cervarix, which was made by GSK, and the one that's currently used is Gardasil. Cervarix is a very good vaccine, but it only protects you against HPV 16 and 18, which are the two main types that cause cervical cancer. Whereas Gardasil also protects you against 6 and 11, which some of you will remember is the virus types that Heather said cause genital warts. So this virus protects you against both genital warts and the, the main strains of cervical cancer. The other things to remember about these viruses is that, they, is that they have a substance called an adjuvant, and we'll come back to that later on. Right, so how do we make HPV vaccines? Well, first of all, we don't want to, go to give anybody a live virus. But if you remember, Heather showed you a picture of live virus particles. And she also said that some of those particles contained no nucleic acid. And they looked a bit like these ones here. So what makes up that very strong outer structure of the, the virus are these L1 proteins. And what these proteins do is they have a unique ability to actually self-assemble. So we have five copies of this protein will actually assort themselves into a pentamer. And those pentamers to, will self-assemble into the icosahedron. And this makes a non-infectious virus-like particle. But there's no viral DNA in there. It can't actually cause an infection. But it does have the proteins that the immune system needs to see to generate protective immunity. Right, so what kind of proteins do you think that the immune system is going to make in order to prevent infection? 
hands up for keratins. Antibodies? Very good, very impressive. <laughs> okay, right, so a bit about another science bit, a bit about vaccine-induced immunity. So normally when we get infected, we will generate a bit of inflammation at the site and then we will get an immune response which will clear that pathogen, we'll get repair of any damaged tissue, we will get regulation of the immune response to get rid of the effector cells when we no longer need them, and critically, we will generate what we call immunological memory. <coughs> now, if you are infected and it's the first time you've seen a pathogen, in order to get antibodies peaking in your bloodstream, it takes about 14 days. However, if it's a memory response, you've already got some antibodies in your bloodstream and you will get new antibodies generated in a much faster and more efficient response taking about four to six days. And the whole purpose of vaccination is to generate memory before we ever get infected. So we can make really fast responses and efficient responses before, uh, as soon as we see a pathogen. Right, so a little bit about vaccines and how they work. So normally, the immune system will respond to infection and make antibody molecules. But in order to do that, the immune system cells need to recognize danger signals to trigger a response. And these are normally produced by the infectious agent itself or by infected cells. But if we just give protein to the cells and not infectious virus, normally the immune system will go, Psh, I'm not bothering with that. Why would I want to make a response to that? So what we have to do is to trigger the immune system by giving that danger signal. And if we have antibodies, we can actually, before we get infected, we can prevent the virus from getting into the epithelial cells. And the danger in the vaccine is provided by the adjuvant that we mentioned before. So if you've ever had a vaccine in your arm and it's given you a sore arm, it's actually the adjuvant that's causing the danger signal that's doing that. And it means that the vaccine is generating a response. So this, again, here we can see in diagrammatic form what we plan to do with the HPV vaccine. Um, giving the adjuvant together with the infe non-infectious virus-like particles so that we end up with antibody-coated viruses when we get infected that don't actually enter our epithelial cells. And this is just to show the vaccine uptake since it was introduced in Scotland in 2008. So Scotland was the first part of the United Kingdom that uh, introduced the vaccine. It was introduced in England and Wales a year later and we have a fantastic record. We have nearly 90% coverage of all people who have been offered the vaccine taking it up to the third dose. Um, we're way ahead of most of the world on this. And the good news is it is actually working. If we look at the HPV types in Scottish women who came for their first smear age 20 in 2013, we've now got a mixture of vaccinated and non-vaccinated women in the population. And what you can see is that the incidence of high-risk HPV in the non-vaccinated women is much higher than it is in the vaccinated women. For the two types that they're vaccinated against, HPV 16 and 18, but critically for these other three types as well, 33, 31, and 45. And the reason for that is that the, oops, sorry, the L1 proteins of these types of viruses are very closely related to these two. So being vaccinated against these two viruses shows some efficacy in protecting against infection with related strains. And the other fantastic news is that we're actually seeing much less disease in the vaccinated population than we used to in previous years. So it really is important to be vaccinated. Right, 
but we can't get rid of cervical screening yet. And there are many reasons for this. Number one is that vaccination doesn't protect against all HPV types and other HPV types may in fact change in the coming years in their prevalence. We haven't found any yet, but there may in fact be some vaccine failures in the future where women have been vaccinated but not generated protective immunity. And unvaccinated women, and currently that means anybody over the age of 25, are not protected. But since the peak age of cancer is in the 40s, we've got a big gap of 20 years where we still need to monitor women to prevent development of cancer. But if you like the biggest elephant in the room, the one that we really don't know the answer to, is how long will that immunity induced by vaccination actually last in any individual woman? So in Scotland again, thanks to the Scottish Government and Health Protection Scotland, we have access to the Scottish HPV Reference Lab, which was in fact set up by Heather a few years ago. And in the Scottish HPV Reference Laboratory, they do molecular testing for the presence of HPV in cervical specimens. And this is important so that the government can actually do surveillance studies and look at what types of HPV types are present in the Scottish population. They also do tests of cure. So if somebody has had treatment, they will have another sample at six months or 12 months, and then they will be tested to see if they have HPV present at that time. And again, if they're HPV negative, at that point, it means that the treatment has worked and they don't need to come back further. They go back into routine screening programs. Clinical management of different difficult cases where people want to know if there's an HPV present in something that's a bit unusual, and I'll come back to that later. And the other important thing that this lab does is to evaluate better ways of testing for HPV because molecular biology progresses all the time and tests get more and more sophisticated. So we need to evaluate which ones are going to be useful. And what we're ultimately moving towards is HPV first, where the first test that you will get done will be an HPV test uh, instead of a cytology test. Right, so this is a case study of a difficult case. So here we have a student who was vaccinated at school. There was no sexual activity prior to being given the vaccine. And then in 2011, when this girl was 20, she came for her first smear. And at that point, she was already picked up with precancerous disease. And in 2012, she had a clinic referral and treatment and the lesion was removed and sent to the Scottish Reference Lab for testing. And what they found was that she actually had a different kind of high-risk virus, not one that she'd been vaccinated against. It was HPV 51 in this case. So the management again was that after six and 12 months, she had cytology and an HPV test and they came back negative and she was returned to routine recall because she had had her lesion removed, there was no chance of her developing cancer. But if she hadn't gone for screening, that would not have been picked up. So it's really important to go for your screens, even if you have been vaccinated. Right, so at this point, I'm going to hand back to Heather to talk about links between here and Malawi. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I hope that we've been able to show to you just how much potential there is for reducing the burden of cervical disease and cancer in Scotland. Um, it's very different in Malawi, as I mentioned at the beginning. But Scotland, as you may also know, has a close relationship with Malawi. In fact, there are something like 94,000 Scots involved in some way with a project in Malawi. A lot of those are school children because there are school linkages, but nevertheless, there are a large number of people and there's quite a bit of support through grants from the Scottish Government. 
Um, I and some colleagues, both within NHS uh, Lothian and the University of Edinburgh, applied to the Scottish Government for funding to carry out some cervical cancer reduction in Malawi. It's a world of contrasts. We've got the national programme of immunisation that Sarah's just been talking about for schoolgirls aged uh, really 11 to 13, most of them 12. There's no HPV vaccine programme in Malawi. We've got a national cervical screening programme for women, which is the envy of the world and is very expensive to deliver. There's no cervical screening in Malawi. There is a government guideline that says it should be there, but they have no resources to provide it. We have excellent facilities for treatment and follow-up of the early stages of disease. There are poor facilities for treatment, record keeping and follow-up. There is no chemotherapy or radiotherapy for when cancers are developed. The surgical skills are limited. There is not even painkillers available for palliative care. And when I started talking about cervical cancer, and this perhaps is where part of the passion comes from, cervical cancer is a horrible cancer. It is very painful. Women will suffer hugely. Their cancer can eat through other organs, making them incontinent. They will smell, they will be ostracized by their families. And indeed, in some cultures, the women will be blamed for bringing this on themselves and left to die in an outhouse. It's not a very uh, happy picture, and it's one that we, with our expertise, experience, and resources, should be able to do something about. Well, what about the immunization, you might ask? Um, well. Actually, HPV vaccine was the most expensive vaccine to be developed ever. And it requires three doses, which is expensive to deliver. It needs good infrastructure. There is an alliance called the Gavi Alliance, a global alliance for vaccines and immunization, which will support the provision of vaccine in low income countries, but only if they can provide the infrastructure for delivery themselves. And one good example in Africa is in Rwanda, where they have managed to get their vaccine coverage up to 90%, like Scotland, at least in one or two years. We don't know if it will be sustained. And Malawi is trying a very small demonstration project with some success. But actually, are they ever likely to be able to provide the infrastructure for delivery of a vaccine like this? The place that Christine, who's in the audience here, and I and others go to is called Nakoma. It's absolutely beautiful. In fact, Malawi is a beautiful country. It's called the warm heart of Africa. The people are very friendly. There is not a lot of uh, strife between different um, tribal groups, um, so they're peaceable. This is Nakoma Mountain, and the rural hospital lies just around the corner there. Most of the population <coughs> live in mud huts like this or single homemade brick constructions and they are subsistence farmers. The barriers to cervical cancer prevention in countries such as Malawi actually start with a lack of knowledge, complete lack of understanding of where cancer would come from and even about viruses. HIV has changed that a bit. They are certainly open to learning, but the knowledge base is low. Geographical inaccessibility means it's difficult to get to clinics. There are very few tarmac roads. And for instance, Nakoma is at the end of the tarmac road. So all the villages are surrounding it that it serves have muddy roads that are washed out every winter by the rains. Financially, the country cannot afford it. But actually, neither can the individual women. Why would you use precious resources when you're well? So a public health measure like screening is probably at the very bottom of their list. In any case, there's a gross shortage of trained people who could deliver services. And if they do try to, 
the quality of the infrastructure is very poor and the record keeping is not quite non-existent but it, nothing like we have here. Add into that the cultural and religious taboos which make it difficult and you can see why programmes are difficult to start. So our first aim in our pro uh, project was to try and tell people about cervical cancer and how it could be prevented by having a group of Malawian people speaking in their local language, Chichewa, Chichewa, verbally, in whatever setting we could find. So we started in the hospital HIV clinics where people have to come back every three months to get their drugs. So there are men and women there because we wanted the men to hear about it as well as the women. We spread to clinics where, again, uh, women, but some men as well, were attending family planning clinics. And then we went out to the villages where we gathered whole village communities together to try and spread uh, messages about how, what could be done to prevent them developing cervical cancer. In fact, one of the things that we tend to say is that actually countries like Malawi have done very well in reducing mater maternal mortal and infant mortality. They've still got a long way to go, but they're no longer at the bottom of the uh, global pile, and their rate of progress is higher than most countries, only for their women to die 10 years later from cervical cancer. It's not good investment of resources. So we have developed um, the program that, uh, that the government would like to have, which is called visual inspection with acetic acid, VIA. This means you just look with the naked eye and a bright light at the cervix onto which has been put a little bit of acetic acid or vinegar because that has the effect of turning abnormal cells white. And so it is possible to pick up abnormalities with a good light source and a good, keen, well-trained eye. That makes it cheap, non-invasive, you don't need high-tech facilities, and you get instant results. However, it's very difficult to keep those skills up. If you're not seeing, not, not practicing enough, you lose your skills. And therefore, because you've got women there and they might not be able to come back, there's a lot of overtreatment, false positives, which wouldn't need to be treated because they would, the, the lesions would disappear. So just that's a normal cervix up at the top, some areas of the acetohwite, as we call it, that show lesions which could be treated. This is a large lesion which is not suitable for immediate treatment. But our emphasis is on a see-and-treat programme. Now, in the UK, any of you who have had a cervical abnormality, the, cer the, the cervical screening samples taken in your GP surgery will be sent to the lab, the result will come back, you might get it three to four weeks later, um, and if you've got an abnormality, you'll then be referred into a clinic and you'll be seen in another two, three, four weeks, depending on how quickly the, the clinic can cope. So the whole process can take six, seven, eight weeks even. Our aim is that you'll see the women once, so we must be able to treat the lesions on the same day. And the government uh, in Malawi and WHO recommend cryotherapy or freezing of the lesions that they see. You need a cylinder like this, heavy, expensive, often not available, leakage very common and what we discovered in talking to women was actually they associated such such cylinders with the many many car and bike welding uh, shops that there were so they were terrified that their services were going to be welded instead we're using a treatment which has been used in Scotland is still being used in Tayside called cold coagulation although thermal coagulation is a better name, because this heats uh, up to 120 degrees and you put a probe, a hot probe, onto the, the lesion for 30 seconds to treat it. The instrument is therefore small, portable, look at its size, 
You only need a minute or two of electricity um, and most hospitals will have electricity even if it's intermittent um, and there's no wastage and the instrument lasts for years. So thinking about that comparison, we've now treated about 70% of the women who had early lesions on the same day. How many women in the UK might prefer to give up one day, long day, um, and if they needed it, have the treatment the same day? Perhaps there's something low resourced countries can teach us, and we shouldn't always think it's a unidirectional. So in Nicoma, in the first year of our project, over 5,000 women were seen and screened. And you can see how those numbers have jumped up um, for, with a maximum in March and levelling off here. The red ones are those who were positive, via positive and needed treatment. This maximum in March is staggering and was very difficult to resource as you can imagine. And you've got to understand the setting to understand why it happens. I said there was no record keeping, no good record keeping. There are no appointment systems. You just come and you wait your turn. Well, in March this year, the women came for several reasons. There had been a lot of sensitization or villages out, um, uh, messages going out in the villages in February. So they were well aware of the potential for screening. But more importantly were climatic conditions, something we'd never have thought of beforehand. That the rains had stopped early, but it was too early for the harvest. So women, who do most of the farming, had little to do. They had time to think about themselves and their own health. So now we know to be better prepared at the end of the rainy season. The cold coagulation we're very pleased with this, and this information will inform what's going, happening in many other countries. It's beginning to be accepted that cold coagulation is a suitable alternative for treatment. Our treatments are running slightly higher than actually the, the um, via positivity because women are being referred in from other centres where they cannot get cryotherapy, but they can get uh, cold coagulation in the coma. We're also doing some HPV testing with an HPV test that hasn't been used anywhere else uh, in Africa. It's called the Cephid uh, test and the reference lab here tried it out first. So again it's because of the association with the whole program of research and work uh, um, going on uh, in Edinburgh that we were able to do this. And the overall HPV prevalence is about 20% compared with the 10% in that early global map I showed you. Uh, our screening program at the moment is covering a complete age range because women have never been screened before. HPV 16 accounts for 15% of that and HPV 18 for 21%. That's lower than in the UK and Europe. And HPV 31 accounts for nearly half of our detection. Now, if this holds true in the cancers as well as in the women for, who are coming for screening, then the vaccine efficacy, as we are using it in the UK and Europe, may not be the same in Africa or in Malawi. Although you will remember that Sarah told you that we did look as if we had got some cross-protection against closely related types in the Scottish data, and 31 is a closely related type. So this is ongoing work. Our project plan, is we're halfway through our three-year project. We concentrated on the hospital first, and I say we, but I do mean that Christine and I and Graham and Hilary, who are part of our Scottish team, actually, we contribute a bit, but the work is done by Malawians. And that is really important. The work is concentrated on the hospital. We, they moved out to five health, health centres in the surrounding area, some of which are church associated, some of which are government. Um, and next year, we'll go to the other five health centres within the whole of their catchment area. 
The first two of the health centres, and this, these are, this is the grounds of one of them, beautiful grounds under the jacaranda tree, shows, we show that the, the figures uh, of attendance in these two clinics in the red and green are coming up and beginning to allow the hospital to settle down at a level, which means we'll be able to assess staffing levels required as the programme embeds in much better. What we're doing is to try and help women in this small area of Malawi. Women like these, the older women, who have never been able to have any kind of screening and who are at high risk of cervical cancer and all its problems. But also teenagers like this poor girl here, who's too old for vaccine to be in, uh, relevant for her because she's almost certainly been sexually active for some time. But also in the hope that it won't be too long before there can be HPV vaccination to protect young girls like these ones in Malawi. So hopefully we've managed to cover a whole picture from speculation about roles of HPV to knowledge, but like icebergs, that knowledge needs to grow. It's hopefully been by an integrated approach from the laboratory studies to collecting samples, keeping data, defining patients, and actually trying to make service changes. And all of it is dependent on global interactions. The public, patients, clinicians, scientists, health policy experts. And that is why we've been so lucky in Scotland, because Scotland brought all of those together and funded the uh, opportunities for them to work to get for us to work together. So thank you for listening to both of us. There's a challenge for us in the UK and in Scotland to ensure that the girls who have been vaccinated do continue to come for screening. The challenge in Malawi is completely different. Its challenge is to try and find resources to provide some level of cervical cancer prevention through a basic screening, affordable, and with skills, a skill, um, skilled work force that can carry that on. But girls, do remember to go for your screen when the invitation comes in. Thank you for listening. <laughs>